Okay, um, hi and how, um, thanks for sticking around until uh, this late hour and it might get a bit technical but um, yeah, when I looked up, um, thought up an, a title for this uh, talk, um, it was late at night and I said I wouldn't go to bed until I had um, a title <laughs> and a friend suggested, okay, last resort, could you squeeze the name of the conference into your uh, talk? <laughs> So I'm like, yeah, okay, fair enough. I googled it, and to my surprise, um, I actually found uh, this. And I thought, okay, I'm going to talk about acceptability judgments, and and there is an app that where you, people are asked of their opinion. And I thought, how fitting. The truth is considerably more disturbing, however, because apparently you can upload pictures of yourself into um, outfits, and then have other people decide which is more acceptable. <laughs> Okay, but I'm uh, digressing um, at this point. What I'll talk about, um, the GoVerb construction, was uh, my dissertation topic, and um, I'll give a few introductory words on the GoVerb construction. I'll refer to it as GoVerb, but it equally applies to CumVerb. I did it in the terms of um, schema semantics, sort of constructional semantics from a cognitive linguistic perspective. And I focus on the corpus uh, data from various perspectives, and now I've actually done uh, some acceptability judgments, very simple uh, tasks, so I'll discuss them and compare uh, corpus distribution with acceptability uh, judgments. Okay, what's the covert construction? I go get the paper every morning, let's go find the paragraph marker where you have the motion verbs go or come, followed by an infinitive. And the interesting thing um, about this construction in English is that it does not allow inflection. So any inflectional contexts are uh, ruled out. Um, this has been referred to as the best stem constraint. And because it seems purely formal, it has attracted most attention in the uh, formalist literature where it's seen as the output of morphosyntactic operations and by being um, a formal constraint is largely independent of usage. From a usage-based, a functional perspective, there have been um, discussions, but they focus on different aspects of the construction. So um, usage-based linguistics has sort of shied away from uh, this formal constraint, uh, which is basically what I um, approached in my dissertation. And I pr um, propose that it is a functionally conditioned constraint. Because not only is the construction subject to a morphological constraint, it's also subject to uh, a semantic constraint where um, the morphological constraint actually follows um, the semantic constraint because English morphology. So I'll go into that uh, a bit later on. So the usage-based perspective, true to its name. Um, if we look at uh, usage examples, we see um, examples such as this. I'm not going to read them out um, at the moment here, but obviously we have them in imperatives, infinitives, subjunctives, and bare indicatives. However, the distribution, if you just count these numbers, um, you see 50% already in infinitives. That has been noted, um, and it could be a direct consequence, obviously, of the bare stem constraint. However, the low number of indicatives should have us a bit suspicious um, at this point. Because if we look at what the construction actually is used for, um, then we see a conspicuous cluster for orders, suggestions, recommendations, um, invitations, encouragements, and so on and so forth, which actually have a correlate on the formal side. So then in imperatives, a directive is actually quite um, obvious. In the infinitives, we see matrix, requestive matrix verbs such as encourage or tell or ask someone to do something. We have adhortatives, deontic modals, um, and causatives. So in a sense, we could say that the infinitives are too gross, uh, coarse grained a category. And um, once we accept that we have a formal side where, where something seems to be going on, so remember what we um, heard before about you shall know a word by the company it keeps uh, in the same vein uh, you shall know a construction by the company it keeps sort of roughly a similar idea and then from a construction grammar perspective because we like boxes uh, we could characterize um, the verb verb construction as a mandative construction okay the same is true for come verb it's just that we have different motion semantics um, obviously Okay, so once we have uh, made that observation, we can formulate um, a schema. 
So in Langecker's term, basically every instance of a construction will receive a sanction or license from uh, the um, abstract schema. And in this case, uh, three conditions have to be met. You have to have a, a certain participant structure, someone who mandates something, and a recipient of the directive. Um, we ha you have a very distinctive type of speech act. And the scene is in two parts, where you have um, the act of mandating something and the event that is mandated uh, precedes um, or follows uh, the mandating act. So if you look at a um, typical example, go get a job, let's go have a drink. You have speaker and hearer, and they map straightforwardly onto mandator and mandatee. The function is directive or permissive, and obviously the act of um, directing something precedes the directed event uh, itself. We have extensions from that schema core um, by more indirect ones where you have, um, most of these are requestive contexts in the matrix sentence, speaker and hearer, but it may also include third parties. Um, the function is indirect, but it still can be directive or invitational, and you still have the same scene um, configuration, roughly. Further removed, even from the core and the extensions, are examples such as this. He was about to go jump, where you have no deontic source, no mandator, mandatee, and you're, you don't really have a speech act in that sense, but you have something that is intended um, or imminent. So you have some reference point that precedes the event uh, that is being prospected, but you don't really have a speech act in that uh, sense. Okay, so this is usually what we refer to as non-assertive, <coughs> non-assertiveness. By contrast, if we look at what um, English inflectional contexts usually encode, um, then we see that we have, again, no mandate and mandatee structure. We have no deontic sources. We also have no speech act in the sense of directive or commissive. And the event structure is all over the place. There may be habituals. Uh, they may actually um, encode something that extends a certain period of time. And by contrast, that is what we call um, assertive. So the usage-based perspective now, because we only look at what does occur, so we can't actually, uh, in a straightforward way, explain what does not occur. However, we can now um, formulate this as a distance from the schema. So um, the, f uh, the more a, an instance of the construction is compatible with the schema core, the more likely it is to occur either in corpora more often than expected, or it's um, less likely to occur if it's further removed from the schema. So you can see a continuum uh, there. Okay, the interesting case here is obvious now, now the indicatives, because they satisfy the morphological constraint However, be, by being assertive, they uh, violate the semantic constraint. So there is a bit of a um, tension there. And I would actually argue that this semantic constraint goes even one further up. So we will have contexts that, are, um, uh, that satisfy the morphological constraint uh, by being infinitive, but they violate the semantic constraint by not being compatible with the core um, of the schema. So this approach here now predicts two things. We, we will see... Um, that the closer we are to the core, the more likely it is to occur above chance in corpora, and the more likely um, it is that it um, gets higher acceptability uh, rates. Okay, so um, that was basically um, the theoretical background, and then I did corpus studies from a variety of different uh, perspectives, diachronic, acquisitional, um, and so on. And I'll briefly um, introduce the general idea of what I did uh, in corpus distribution, is I coded um, the uses of uh, go come verb in terms of schema compatibility by some um, landmark context, and actually that captures the data really well. Um, in in terms, I didn't even have a bin category, uh, so to speak. I did it for go uh, verb and come verb, and you can already see that the rate of imperatives is extremely high, whereas the rate of indicatives is really low. At this point, we don't really know whether that's surprising because it could just be that all corpora have 40% or 30% uh, imperatives and only 5% um, indicatives. I did the same for the coordinated alternative. Um, that won't concern as much here. But to assess whether this distribution is 
uh, conspicuous. I also coded um, a thousand bare verb form users from the corpus that were not auxiliary or the go um, come verb construction itself. And here we see a mirror image of the su supposed continuum between um, um, highly directive and highly representative uh, context. Beyond that, it's a bit difficult to see um, the structure in that data. And um, we had this morning, we, talk, we heard something about the conceptual metaphor similarity is uh, proximity. Um, so a very similar method of visualizing this tabular data is correspondence analysis. And if you're familiar with Martin's um, bubbles, it's a slightly different method, but the same uh, principle. It will plot association and dissociation in terms of spatial uh, distances. So here are the results. Um, the, what we see is that we have a continuum from left to right in terms of constructions. The control average corpus use is here, whereas the serial verbs are over here, occupying uh, zero territory. And we also have the requestive and directive context over here, whereas the more assertive ones um, are over here. If we get rid of the constructions, because we don't really need them at this point, um, we can actually see that the connection here between um, these contexts, that's generally an idea that um, we have highly complex multidimensional data, which can still be conceived of as points on a linear relationship. So um, this line was drawn by the data. Uh, so that's more or less the shortest route uh, through uh, the network. And later on, we will need uh, these numbers. They it's te quite technical, but roughly they correspond to the values on the x-axis, and they will be used to compare the acceptability ratings uh, with uh, corpus uh, distribution. Okay, and that, these numbers also um, explain why I ordered the rows in the table the way I did. Okay, then I said, okay, well, if we find this in corpora, how much um, of that is um, visible in acceptability judgments? I ran a very simple um, design um, and constructed 30 pairs, um, 15 per construction, seven bare contacts and three inflected contacts just to ensure that um, they would be able to use the entire uh, range of the scale. And I varied the uh, sentence pairs by whether the verb is attracted to the construction or not. So for imperatives, for instance, go find help immediately find is a highly distinctive verb um, for the construction, whereas seek uh, is not. Or in the requestive context, come stay is highly distinctive, whereas come live um, is not. And in this case, actually, it doesn't, frequency is not much, as much a matter of um, uh, distinctiveness here. Okay, for the semi-modals, you can have, you have a contrast between deontic modals that are arguably more closer to the schema core and the intentional ones. Um, similarly, for the infinitival complements, you have something that implies motion and futurity and something that does not, habituals. Um, and similarly, with the indicatives, I varied between something that involves motion and could have a more easier um, interpretation as non-assertive than um, a habitual one or a, a stative uh, construction here. I set them up in uh, Qualtrics. That's an online survey uh, software. Um, did the usual thing, various lists, various blocks, uh, pseudo-randomized to balance for construction type, verb, attraction, and the type of noun phrase, whether we have a pronoun or a full uh, noun phrase. This is m more or less what it looked. I had five sentences to a page um, where only one context occurred per page, um, and I had only the endpoints labeled, and I asked participants to rate um, of how likely they would um, find that sentence in um, a conversation with friends or family, sort of the usual um, thing that you find in the experimental uh, literature. My participants were 40 monolingual L1 speakers um, that were born in the US or Canada, live in the country of birth, um, have been abroad for a maximum of six months in their lives, and they were recruited online through uh, Prolific, it's a crowdfunding um, crowdsourcing platform. Uh, and they were paid for the um, uh, study, which took an average of three minutes. Uh, they came from a broad range of geographical 
uh, backgrounds. The slight underrepresentation of California might have to do with the fact that it was Saturday morning, 9 o'clock for them, so College America may have been asleep. Um, <laughs> We had 22 males, 15 females, they were aged. I actually um, asked for these criteria specifically. That's one of the um, advantages of prolific. And um, as I said, each rated 35 sentences were five were training sentences at the beginning of the uh, experiment. Okay, the results. Um, here are plotted, and I have box plots. Um, um, in ascending, no, in descending order of um, schema distance. Anyways, the <laughs> core context to the left and the um, inflected context to the right. So we have the morphological constraint that runs here. So to the right of that line, we will expect low values. And the semantic constraint, because by the way, I manipulated the uh, semimodals, we would expect um, higher ratings um, here because they satisfy both constraints. That's borne out. That's not much of a uh, surprise and the difference between um, these blocks do not seem to be uh, statistically significant. So what's interesting is what happens uh, when they satisfy the morphological constraint but when they um, violate the semantic constraint and there appears to be the missing link. So we don't really have a sudden drop um, but we see a continuum here until about that line before it drops off uh, considerably. Also note that we have increasingly more variation uh, towards the end of the semantic uh, continuum uh, there. Um, the, I ran a multiple um, uh, linear mixed effects model on uh, the bare context, and um, this is statistically, um, this line actually is borne out by um, this model as well, where we have um, significantly lower values for the semantic constraint violators, but there is no difference uh, between um, the context that actually um, are instantiate this, the schema core or its closer um, extensions. I also included um, an interaction between uh, the syntactic context and the verb attraction. And the interesting pattern here is that verb attraction just plays no role for those that satisfy the semantic constraint, uh, but values are tend to be higher if the verb in question is attracted to the construction. So it seems that verb attraction um, helps or sort of saves um, acceptability uh, ratings. How does that relate now to a corpus distribution? Uh, because the, the way the box plots are ordered here implies that the categories are at um, equal distances, um, but they're clearly not. So if, if we plot uh, the corpus distribution, that was the numbers that were in the um, correspondence analysis diagram, um, with the acceptability ratings, uh, we find a relatively straightforward um, relationship between um, acceptability and corpus uh, distribution. And I would argue that this diagram is considerably less awkward for usage-based uh, <laughs> linguistics. If you want it to be a positive relation, I just flipped um, the <laughs> x-axis, just in case um, we're wondering. and. Um, Okay, just to basically sum up what the, uh, the correlation here, that's the, the values from the correspondence analysis, um, high correlation, the frequency in the construction of these contexts, right, given here as a percentage, is moderate. Some would consider it relatively high. It's not significant because we have a relatively small uh, sample. And finally, the frequency of um, the syntactic context in the corpus is... Um, strongly negative, which is understandable because conceptually correspondence analysis is the inverse of uh, corpus frequency, the way it, this was operationalized. Interestingly, I'll, uh, maybe we'll have time for this in a discussion later on, it doesn't really matter which corpus you use or which genre. Um, it works well with just the data from the news corpus. Acad um, academic uh, genre, slightly worse but still significant. Um, web data where half of the data in the NCAL corpus doesn't even come from North America. Um, the switchboard corpus, um, a spoken corpus, um, okay, that seems surprising. Uh, it seems not surprising, but actually it is, more or less. Um, and the child's corpus, that's the first corpus I tested where the correlation is not significant, uh, which is also kind of weird, but I uh, have some suggestions there. 
However, um, to sum this up, we have a robust correlation between two types of performances. So one is the um, language production performance and the other one is the uh, language comprehension, more or less, although it's, uh, we are dealing with an offline task. So, but what are my um, conclusions here? Um, what's been noted in the literature that tries to match corpus data with um, experimental data is that we have a frequency acceptability mismatch. You can have a high and a low frequent item that receive the same kind of acceptability. Um, we saw that with the imperatives and the Y at hortatives. Um, imperatives very frequent, Y at hortatives very infrequent, yet they receive the same kind of um, acceptability um, values. And you can have two low frequency items that diverge in uh, acceptability. And we saw that here with the indicatives and the Y at hortatives, they're roughly equal in the construction, yet they receive large um, vastly diverging um, acceptability ratings. So what I proposed here is a perspective from the schema distance um, that frames acceptability as a function of schema uh, compatibility. So acceptability um, may, not, may be independent of raw frequency, but that depends on how you define uh, frequency, how you measure frequency. Uh, it depends on how um, complex your construction is, how schematic it is, how um, uh, simplistic it is. Um, but obviously, whatever your idea of frequency is and how you operationalize it, uh, compatibility is not independent of usage or experience because it's sort of even association, I mean, has to do with um, <coughs> uh, language use and experience of the same. Therefore, it's also measurable in corpora. There's, there's been some criticism uh, from the cognitive linguistics um, literature that say, well, we can't really measure it in corpora because it has to do with something else that's beyond uh, textual frequency. Uh, but I would argue um, that compatibility may actually be um, an interesting avenue to go down. However, there are methodological implications because the GoVerb construction is anything but very complex. All I needed was one variable. I coded one variable. I only have two types, so happy days to all the morphologists, uh, where things get so increasingly complex very, very quickly. Um, that, that is a methodological uh, question of how we measure that in the corpora. However, the um, empirical implication here is obviously that whether or not you include usage in your idea or model of language, um, performance in an experiment seems to be highly correlated with language experience. So whether you want to include that or discard it, you will have to include it in um, your design um, experiment um, as well. OK, that was me. Yeah, OK, thank you. <laughs> Very cool, by the way. Thank you. Uh, um, I guess I was also interested, though, in uh, giving out for verb constructions. What about uh, if you add a, like an and, if you have a conjunction, and it's also, I would suspect it's also reduced really often, such that that becomes acceptable uh, to inflect the second verb. Did, that, did you run across that at all, or did that play? Uh, um, that's something where corpora seriously uh, fail. Uh -huh. um, unless you have something like orthographic variants, I did not specifically look for it uh, in terms of corpus data. Uh -huh. A friend of mine sent me um, this really cool link and said uh, it was a video in one of the TV shows that she was watching. Uh -huh. And it has, she says, like, there is a goes gets uh -huh. example where, it's, where it is inflected. And it's like, oh, cool. So I looked up the script and it had been corrected in the script. <laughs> to goes and gets, but it was very clearly uh, a goes gets use. So that's um, a problem with the acceptability. I didn't specifically test in that because it's um, the general uh, understanding is that go and verb is not subject to the morphological constraint. It is, however, very skewed 
Okay, so there's some sem semantic similarity between go verb and go and verb, um, but they serve slightly different functions. So what we saw in the diagram is that the coordinated are actually in between the serial constructions and average corpus use. So they're less influenced by the morphological constraint and they're also less influenced by the semantic uh, constraint. Um, so the prediction obviously would be that um, all acceptability ratings for the semantic constraint violators would increase for the coordinated variants if I included them. Um, I didn't specifically test in, in this experiment, but that would be the yeah. prediction. Yeah. Questions. That's an interesting way of looking at it. Thank well, you. <laughs> yeah. Um, did you ex expect these results? Yes. Did you expect yeah. Um, I, was, I was always thinking, generally, with that, do you have a hunch where you're going? What you present us? Did you? Is this, was this on your radar? It was. It was on my radar. It was. Um, practically, what well, quoting Martin was low-hanging fruit. Um, that's what I. What I expected. <coughs> In the results, the, mm -hmm. the what surprised me was the level of clarity, the correlation between the, the measures. Uh, that is that that as it, that was a bit. Well, it was almost shocking because I didn't. I said, okay, well, I, I, all I wanted was to see: do we have a drop in acceptability rates? And if we do, where where will, will we have it? Mm -hmm. um, this strong correlation, uh, yeah, that surprised me um, a little as well. But um, there was. One um, acceptability survey that was done in the literature before uh, was reported by Pullum, uh, and but in, he only tested for binary judgments. So do you accept it? Do you not accept it? Mm -hmm. So they did. They didn't specifically uh, manipulate the semantic context. Mm -hmm. They just gave participants all kinds of syntactic uh, mm -hmm. context. And what was interesting, and it kind of went under the radar for everyone that followed in that discussion is that a fifth of respondents actually rejected the indicatives, the bare indicatives outright. Um, so that was an indication of saying, OK, that's probably what I would expect as well. And we see that variation with indicatives. There's quite some, OK, is there some communicative web value to it? Uh, can I construct uh, a context? Um, as well, also, you mentioned variation. Sorry about <laughs> um, you mentioned variation, but you can also show clearly. So as, as soon as there's insecurity as to whether or not you get more variation. Right? You get more variation, you get more um, influenced by the verb type that's yeah. included. Uh, yeah, all basically that runs into the same direction. Um, if one perhaps that makes it um, Relatively clear now. What what uh, what I've done here is sort of the semi one. That's the deontic modal. That's the uh, intention going to. Mm -hmm. That's the uh, to infinitive complement that implies motion, and that's the habitual one, and so on. So the one, the index one is always the one that's supposed to be closer to the schema, mm -hmm. um, and we can still see the drop here, but it's much more um, smooth mm -hmm. as where. Um, here, and I suppose I could violate these contexts, they, they were more like controls or sort of making sure that the range of acceptability was stretched. But if we, um, I probably, depending on how you manipulate them, prob maybe that would, may disappear as well, but it doesn't have to be for this uh, model to work. Um, it's also related to this, I have another idea, that reminds me back of my psycholinguistic days, and yeah. But what would be really cool if you approach this psycholinguistically? Here are the probability rates. But when you really also look at decision times, mm -hmm. yeah. and then you have individuals really deciding, and then you take this into account as well, and say, how long do they actually take? And then you filter in variation, and you filter in just basically decision by milliseconds. Yeah. That would really be a nice addendum to this research design. That, that's probably that's likely what I would expect as a hypothesis. But that's that, what you would get. I mean, they would yeah. take longer. Right? Yeah. Because it's secure. Yeah. But it would be nice to show it's also nice to publish something. Yeah. yeah. Cool, thanks. Yeah, and it's something that you had comments on um, regards to the Turing's uh, problem, so why is that so different? Um, 
uh, oh sorry yeah uh, why is the um, why does in a sense does that in one sense it seems that's not surprising this high curve is that what yeah, the, the last course that you showed. Uh, Charles. Yeah, Charles. Charles. Um, okay, so why is switchboard actually this high correlation more surprising? Um, mm. The level of imperatives in the go-verb construction switchboard is actually lower than the level of indicatives. Okay, so it's not raw frequency. Uh, why is that? Because, okay, it's a spoken corpus, but it's also a corpus of telephone conversations between strangers, so they wouldn't use imperatives. Mm. So at the same time, the overall distribution of imperatives in the corpus is extremely low. So there's only 1% of imperatives com um, compared to 6% in, in uh, other average corpora. Um, so this is, again, a distributional um, a question of distribution. So And initially I thought, okay, why is this so low, even though you, you, the go-verb construction in Childs occurs almost exclusively in directives? Mm -hmm. But the, by a distributional approach so is the rest of the corpus all full of directives and commissives. So the distance between uh, normal corpus distribution and the distribution in the construction is not as great. Um, so that again speaks against a simplistic view of measuring frequency because that is actually very uh, susceptible to changes between corpora, mm -hmm. whereas distributional measures tend to be very or, or tend to be more robust against fluctuations um, in the data. Mm -hmm. So that's something I, I'm looking into right now with other um, distribution measures. And in the switchboard, are there really fewer imperatives? Yeah. Okay. I, was a bit, I was a bit surprised that um, we have in, I think it's sort of like 9% it might not be statistically all that significant, but there is um, a 9% imperative rate versus a 12% indicative rate. So it's 9 to 12 rather than 30 to 5. Um, but imperatives in general are 1%, I think, and indicatives are 40%. So that's the kind of correct uh, for that um, analysis. The um, Yeah, it's very difficult to see. Uh, so basically, you see that the whole thing is kind of shifted, although that does, is in itself not meaningful. But the general uh, gist from come verb to go verb to come and verb to go and verb and to control with the respective context is still the same in a, a highly specific um, register uh, corpus. And you're saying that the imperatives aren't there in switch yeah, it's not face-to-face -face communication, and the few imperatives that you do find are usually in something like, yeah, and then I told him, go fish, or or something. So it's it's more it's not <laughs> go take a hike. That's yeah, um, one of the highest distinctive uh, colexemes actually in the um, go verb construction is fuck. Uh, which I had to exclude uh, from the experimental items uh, for ethical reasons. <laughs> of a self-imposed ethical uh, control. Um, but yeah, so these imperatives, they do not, they, they're dif a different kind of imperatives as compared to imperatives in fiction writing, uh, for instance. I think they're more, more embedded. Uh, or maybe something, go tell me about your dress code at work. I think that's the first file in the switchboard corpus, so um, I don't know. Uh -huh. Okay, any other questions? How's your chance? If not, then it's thanks. Thank you.